Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Levin Keller. Uh, I've known Levin for quite a while, uh, and I know him fairly well. We've also had him on the show before. That was uh, quite a long time ago, together with uh, Asher of Coinchar. At the time, he sort of jumped in uh, to talk about uh, the VAT question. Bitcoin VAT question, which was sort of a hot topic back then. Uh, uh, but now we're back, and we're going to have more time today to dive into what he's been up to, uh, in particular the startup he's working on called Coino. And, and I've kind of you know witnessed the, the birth of this child from the very start. So you know, it's, a, it's a great pleasure that we, we can talk about it today. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting product and sort of uh, a product that's you know a little bit uh, building for the future, which I guess many of us are doing in the space, but uh, I think this exemplifies it, uh, you know, better than most products. So thanks uh, for coming on today, Levin. My pleasure, my pleasure very much. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, just, you know, so people understand, so you guys are in the same city, you guys are both in Berlin. Uh, you're not working out of the same co-working space, are you? No, currently not, but we, uh, we, we were for a while. moving there. And the two of us were also members of the um, Bitcoin Center here in Berlin, which now moved into the Ethereum office. It's very, very interesting place to be, too. So you're working out of the Ethereum office now? Uh, Not at the moment. So we were before, uh, so we were working in the same office at the sort of previous location of the Bitcoin Center. But then uh, Levin went to the accelerator, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that later. And we moved over to the Ethereum offices. Now, Levin is still at the accelerator. Uh, and, but maybe he's going to come back here and, and uh, to the Bitcoin Center. Cool. Awesome. Also, uh, I, I, should, I should mention this is kind of funny. Um, when, when Levin first came to Berlin, uh, you know, he was this, this little bearded guy. And he was running around. Uh, warning everyone of this like dark, dark scenario with the VAT, and nobody took him seriously. Everybody was like, "What, what, what, what is this? Uh, what is up, what is up with him?" But but it did turn out to be quite uh, quite visionary. I think he was right there that there was a real problem. I you know realized that all a bit later, but uh, it was it was quite interesting. How he, he was very obsessed with this topic, and I, I think probably knows more about this than, I don't know, maybe anyone else in Germany or, well... Uh, I mean, I, I, hate to, I hate to be right about stuff sometimes. Uh, I usually tend to do so, but uh, yeah, this is unfortunate. But yeah, we, we all know that the ECG high code uh, decision is very interesting. It will come up soon, but uh, yeah. Just yeah, of course. Wait for that. So we, we won't talk about this topic today, but the, the basic issue is if you sell Bitcoins to someone, you have to charge VAT on that, uh, and it's sort of for the Americans. It's you know it's a little bit like sales tax. Of course, that's it's quite of a it's uh, it would be absolutely terrible for Bitcoin if that actually came to pass, and it's it's, it's still in limbo. We don't know which way it's going to go. Any idea when we're going to find out what the, the verdict is on that? No, we'll take uh, some time. Like like people tell like like one and a half or two years even. We will see about that, but uh, this this can take quite some time. There are news coming out of it, going into it, but it's no no nothing nothing has been decided yet. So um, talking about Coino, can you tell us a bit uh, why did you start Coino? So yeah, of course. Uh, as I was concerned with the with the VAT issue, I also dig dug into the question of how to actually tax your income. How would you you use Bitcoin as a professional in like a shop or so and accept Bitcoins and spend them again? And then you pretty pretty soon learn that it's very difficult to keep track of, of all your Bitcoins incoming, outgoing. So uh, yeah, this was the, the the biggest issue that I that I had and then I, I saw. And I thought, why is there no product that's automating all this? And then this is what we did. We built a Coino, the Bitcoin bookkeeper. What we want to do is we want to provide people tools to use the very same software they have been using all the time, like Electrum or Bitcoin Wallet or Armory or whatever, but just have a, on the side a read-only bookkeeper that's keeping track of the payments. So you would use the, the old software, and then whenever a payment comes in or goes out of your books, we can just store the, uh, the, the, the bookkeeping information that you need, like what's, what's the invoice number, what is the amount that has been sent, what is the value at the time, and then you can do a tax report very easy at the end of the year. 
So, yeah, I mean, I must say, uh, so it, it's kind of, you know, we understand, we know that, you know, we bought Bitcoin at a certain price, right? And now you spent the Bitcoins and the price has changed. Well, this is a taxable event. I mean, I think this is pretty clear to everyone. Now, in Germany, I think, you know, if you, if you wait longer than 12 months, uh, it, it, you know, you wouldn't have to pay taxes on that. But this becomes, like, it, it quite frankly scares me, the idea that at some point I will have to actually account for, like, everything that has happened here. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, a nightmarish scenario and um, very, very, very difficult to do. And for us, you know, with Epson Bitcoin, we uh, we try, uh, or like we are basically a Bitcoin only company, and we are not we're not a complicated company, right? Like we don't have a lot of transactions, but still, it gets kind of messy very, very quickly. So it's, I mean, I think there's a there's a, a big need to have someone to like make this kind of smooth and easy. Because otherwise, this is just not going to happen, right? Like, I mean, I think um, otherwise, I think the only the only option for a merchant is just that they say we're going to use BitPay, uh, we're going to get fiat currency, and we won't ever hold uh, bitcoins themselves. But as soon as you start holding bitcoins, it, it gets very, very, uh, it gets very hairy very quickly. Yeah, and and even more so if you're a private person and and you have this like this this rule that after a year you can sell your bitcoins without paying any tax for it, which is the case in Germany and other jurisdictions sometimes too. Uh, the problem is how do you prove that you had the bitcoins for right. a year? Absolutely. Let's say you, you made out of thousand euros, you made a million and buy a nice house. You need to kind of like 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 prove that you actually had the bitcoins for more than a year, so to be able to sell them tax-free, and this becomes also an issue. This is something that we want to solve. We're also, of course, reading and working ourselves into the jurisdiction concerning these tax issues, but on the other hand, if you want to do all these bookkeeping events, it's pretty easy to do it automatically if you have a nice software tool to do it. To do it by hand is, of course, a nightmare, but if you're running a shop, like let's say you, you have an online shop and you put, like people are purchasing stuff for Bitcoin on your site, and you're buying stuff from your Chinese uh, uh, subcontractor or for your Chinese supplier, and pay him in bitcoins too. Um, then actually, all these events can be tracked rather easily, and you just need to to, to check the fiat values to match them and so on. Um, and today, the solution for that for many people is to use some kind of centralized service uh, like Coinbase or so, where actually also the keys are stored for the bitcoin uh, wallets that the user is, is handling and using. Uh, we just want to solve this or, or remove this headache uh, as of the security concern, and want to leave the user with the private keys but just use the public keys to, to track the payments and to make all the necessary bookkeeping for it. So I want to say, you said something that's very important there, is the same from centralized services. So I, I think what this allows people to do, and what, what's really valuable about it, is if, if anybody wants to not use one solution, or perhaps you know they're satisfied with one component of Coinbase, uh, but they're not uh, satisfied with their invoicing and their bookkeeping uh, services, uh, which, you know, I, I'm not particularly fond of the way they do invoicing, for instance. You can use a solution like this that's really specialized at doing one thing. And, um, you know, that thing is, you know, record keeping. And you guys certainly have, like, jurisdiction specific stuff as well in there, which Coinbase might not, right? And so. also, we're, we're, we're building, like, like, like we, we want to see the whole picture. I mean, people, they, they don't just use Coinbase, but Coinbase kind of assumes it. So you can get, if you're using Coinbase, you can get, we just talked to someone who did this, you can get some kind of tax report for them, but the fun part is that they actually consider every withdrawal of Bitcoins from your account as a sell. So they'll, they, they'll mark it as a sell in the tax, as a tax event. But it's actually not the case because you just move the Bitcoins, which is your right, to a secure location like you call storage. And then sometime later, you put it back on there and sold it or so. So you need to, to, to kind of like separate transfers that actually went out of your kind of like system of, of all that the wallets that you control and, and these transfers went inside of it because if it was inside then it's not a taxable event. And this is where Coinbase currently lacks a feature and also we want to provide tools to import old wallets like, like Electrum for example. You, you didn't start using Bitcoin and thought maybe this will become a business that I at some point want to do a PEX report for. So you need to import all the historical data, and this is 
there's currently, as far as we know, no service out there that does this, who supports as many wallets as we do for this kind of like broad picture that is that is given. And we also want to support Coinbase in the idea of of of, of getting like everything that is open to us. Coinbase has an API, so we we can get the data out for our users too. Now I'm curious for a company like us that has been keeping our books. Uh, I mean, we, we've been using multiple wallets uh, since uh, since we first started, uh, you know, billing and and uh, and getting getting uh, revenue. We've used multiple wallets. We're not really sure, you know, where the transactions are. We we have um, we have uh, Excel sheets and other ways of keeping our books. Do you plan on integrating some features that would allow? Uh, people that don't necessarily have all the wallet transactions like on the blockchain to show for, to import those into a system like this, and you know, from there, uh, start like a clean wallet seed and then go from there? You know, yeah, so it dep- of course you can you can p- pick a time and then you just give us like an amount that you had at the time being and then later. I mean, this is not yet implemented. We are still beta and evolving our product. Um, but uh, on the other hand, usually if you track all these kind of payments, you should be able to go back. You should be able to say, oh, there's a payment coming into one of my wallets from this uh, uh, other uh, address, and then you say, like, okay, I have a matching address, like a magic event in my Excel sheet, which shows that this amount was actually incoming from another wallet of mine. Then you can do, like, a forensic and put also this address into your wallet and say, okay, this is also an internal transfer. And then we'll, we'll work on from that. So whenever you use that wallet in another scenario, then we also show it as one of your wallets and an internal transfer if money left this wallet to another of your wallets. If you start mixing your private wallets and your professional wallets, then you might have some issues, of course. Then it gets rather complicated, and then also we need to think of a clever way how you can like highlight certain transactions as being private and the others as professional. But it's actually also an unprofessional way to use a professional account mixed with a private one. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, no. And uh, of course, a core, a core sort of design aspect and I guess philosophy aspect of Coin as well, I think, is that you guys don't hold private keys, right? That you only do public keys, uh, and you're watch only. So yes, this is a very important fact. We want to be a watch only solution um, for several reasons. Uh, I, I want to sleep tight over the night, and I couldn't if I was like like. Putting the the wealth of or, or the well-being of a lot of my customers at, at risk uh, because I have a centralized service that could be hacked like any other and then uh, lose bitcoins. Even Coinbase is not completely secure to these kind of attacks, as we have seen. Um, so yeah, this is something that that we that we definitely never want to do. Hold our customers sole private keys. We might be looking into some part of stuff like co-signing or so, so that we only hold part of the private keys that that are needed to 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 release uh, funds for the customers. And um, yeah, we also think that that this this idea of just watching the blockchain uh, and just being a layer on top and not being the sole service that you rely on. So you might might use one service for your security and the other one for bookkeeping. This is kind of what Bitcoin is about: to keep the stuff separated and not having everything in one point, so that also all the data is gathered at some point and can be leaked. So um, yeah, this is why why we chose to do only the watch only thing. Um, so, are, are you planning on also do offering, for example, invoicing in the future and and things like that? So, what people are doing is they um, they they store uh, their public root seed data with us. Um, with that, following like this upload, we can track all the payments that are coming into this wallet and going out of this wallet, and we can also generate new keys. And in the future, we will will provide a feature with, that you can just have a link or a profile page where people can come to. We deliver a new, freshly generated public key for this payment, and the payment goes not to us, but directly to your wallet. Um, for that, of course, still we need to up the security, because um, we might get attacked, and people might replace the public keys, uh, which which people think are yours, but with, with others, so that the payment gets redirected. Uh, so there's a little, like, like still a gap security-wise, but it's uh, uh, it's more convenient and also for you for your privacy much better if you use a, a new key for every payment instead of like, pasting it on your website or so. And we're definitely looking into this. This is definitely a feature that we plan on doing, uh, and also automate all this so that you can use it in your web store, for example, if you're accepting Bitcoin payments and just store one public key with us, and then we notify you when the payment is set, has been settled, and then you can ship the product that you sold, for example. And so, how would that work in the case if you're if you're generating a new public key every time and you know the wallet might also be generating a public key how do you make sure that those like you're not generating the same key for perhaps two payments 
So this is uh, actually done through um, subchains. So um, we, we didn't really decide on, on which subchain to use, but usually uh, you so you have this node. It's a starting node for the for the for the public seed data, and then you use one chain that goes from there. This chain zero is for the external ad, um, addresses, so addresses that you would give out to third parties and so on. Um, this is what what the what it usually does. Then there is the the chain number one, like the second one, but of course you start counting at zero, and then uh, you you would uh, generate addresses there that are only used for internal reasons. For example, change. So whenever you send some bitcoins off, the rest that has been on the address goes to another address, and this is one of the internals. So we could use, for example, chain number two, um, and then we would you would just follow another chain. Uh, as the, the the wallet itself, so um, we need to, to check out the standards for that. Um, we're currently working on so this is still work in progress, also Bitcoin wise. Um, but but you could just use other like other paths that that come from the same source, uh, so that you don't collide in any uh, circumstances. I wasn't even aware that you could do multiple uh, yeah sub sub chains from an HD wallet. You can arbitrary uh, arbitrary amount of them if you want. Um, yeah. This is the whole idea. Like it's like it's a it's a it's a tree that it's it's branching out indefinitely if you want. Um, but usually only two of these chains are used, and and you can use as many as you want to to provide additional services. So right now, right, if if, if merchants accept Bitcoin, I think for the most part, especially if if they're larger merchants, they uh, work with a payment processors like a Coinbase or BitPay, and and for the most part, they convert to fiat. Uh, this obviously is the sort of solution that will be for those who who keep holding bitcoins. Now, what kind of timeline do you see? Do you see this happening uh, anytime soon? Because uh, uh, one one topic we've been talking about a lot is is the volatility issue. Uh, obviously, that is a, a huge barrier when it comes to to companies starting to hold bitcoins on their book. But uh, how uh, where do, how do you see that playing out? Um, so there are the two two possible scenarios. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, Bitcoin can become can become stable. This is my personal um, idea, probable, but maybe also it will go up quite a while before that happens. Um, so right now, Bitcoin is rather stable, but not really reliable. Nobody thinks that the K these like two hundred euros, two hundred thirty dollars will hold indefinitely or so. Um, but right now, I would feel rather comfortable as a merchant to accept bitcoins, and we also see merchants to accept bitcoins. I mean, like here in Berlin, you have this bar room seventy seven they're accepting bitcoins and holding on to them. Um, you have overstock like they they also keeping portion of the bitcoins and uh, there was a a, um, a bitpay uh, like a bitpay rep representative who recently said that uh, I think more than fifty percent of the bitcoin users a uh, bitpay users are holding on to at least a portion of the bitcoin. So I mean, like like a lot of people who, are especially new to Bitcoin, are afraid of the volatility. But a like a long, like a big part of all the Bitcoin users also is keeping at least part of it uh, as Bitcoins and also on their holdings. And of course, all the traders they also keep on the, the Bitcoin. And I, I think like in a year or so we'll see whether people consider Bitcoin to be coming stable or whether people understand that this is finally a flaw in the Bitcoin protocol and that we need to do something about it to change. The, the like maybe the money supply or, or some, something alike and then we need to find some kind of mechanism that is actually stabilizing the price and I'm not talking about a central bank here but more about a self-adopting algorithm like the, the difficulty that gets adjusted to the amount of bitcoins that are released over time and uh, I don't know yet how this can be implemented maybe it's something that Ethereum will do so um, like monitor multiple exchanges and finding like like rapid movements in the price and then doing automated Automatic counter measurements, but I think if this really becomes a problem, the when it stays a problem, the volatility of Bitcoin, then this is just some issue that we need to solve in a new version of Bitcoin or maybe in a hard fork. Yeah, I mean, to those who are interested in this topic, we had a, a whole episode with Robert Sams, who's written a proposal uh, for a currency that works exactly that way. Well, it's a proposal, right? So there's no working implementation, and it's pretty complex from a technical perspective and, and you know we were talking about this uh, with Adam back as well and and those guys and I think that's a good point were sort of skeptical even though they weren't familiar with the proposal in detail they were very skeptical that it would actually be possible to do this in a secure way but yeah I think we will see where it plays out per personally I, I'm I'm very skeptical that I, I don't believe Bitcoin's going to become stable uh, or the value of Bitcoin is going to become stable 
anytime soon, uh, not in the next 10 years. Or So, yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, I think, I, I guess you guys will have the flexibility as well to implement other solutions, implement other currencies, maybe, maybe integrate create some sort of hedging tools. So, um, yeah, yeah hedging, I don't, I don't know about, but I, of course we'll, we'll support other cryptocurrencies. Uh, the big thing with Bitcoin is that there are a lot of good libraries out there already, like a lot of open source stuff. We're also contributing to it, but we're relying also on a lot of open source libraries, especially JavaScript node libraries. And they are not there for any altcoin or, already, like in the same quality as they are for Bitcoin. So this is why Bitcoin was really easy or very easy for us to, to, to implement in the first place. We don't have to, to, to build everything from scratch, but it doesn't hold as much for, let's say, Dogecoin or like something like more uh, exotic, like Monero. So um, there you would have to build a lot of the tools yourself, and uh, this doesn't make really sense for us right now. But, I mean, as, 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 as the currency grows, like as an altcoin grows, I think also the ecosystem grows, the technology grows, and the libraries grow around it, and then we will be very happy to integrate it too. So, what what has your experience been with with building a product that you know feels quite far for the future? Like, how do people uh, respond to that in the Bitcoin space, and and maybe out of also outside the Bitcoin space. They're calling me like on a weekly basis and asking when it's done. So uh, it's actually not far in the future. So a lot of people have a need for this. Maybe not, maybe not the the, the hundreds of thousands of users that we need to that we need to do like uh, uh, to, to push this product and to get like like the, the huge traction that we're looking for. Um, but they're already out there, so so people are in need of the tax reports today, and, and this is these are people that are using it uh, as a tool um, as soon as we, we release it, and then they, they're on it and say like I need this service to be added and that one, and then I can um, can I can I can use it. But I see also with the growth of Bitcoin, I see more and more users uh, to be using it, and and they're like big companies who say let's use Bitcoin, and then they ask that their their bookkeeping department what should we do about it and bookkeeping says like please don't do it there's no tool for it as soon as we have these tools we are also enabling the ecosystem and the space to just adopt bitcoin also the, the big companies and so on this is what i see as a as a uh, future for this so so who are you targeting are you targeting small companies like small merchants or or local restaurants and the local businesses or are you targeting more like larger enterprise uh, or both like what what's your target market we're doing both at the same time to a certain degree. So we have this front-end user-faced um, product that is on our website, beta.coiner.com. Everybody can use it already uh, with limited functionality as it's beta. But um, what, what we also, we are also in talks with, with banks, with, with larger companies who want to, to use Bitcoin on scale uh, and think about shipping white-level solutions to them and not them having them rely on our web service, but some, building something on the side, maybe a little... Uh, uh, adjusted to their personal needs, but this is what we're what we're looking into. So we want to to tackle the small and medium businesses, make it easy for them to use a, a kind of like um, ready product and which is the, out of the box. And then we have these these more um, specialized, uh, adopted uh, versions for for larger companies. So, uh, are you planning on uh, integrating with uh, bookkeeping software like I don't know QuickBooks, uh, Sage, or others? Yes, so QuickBooks is definitely the first one that we want to do. Um, in Germany, we're doing Datev, which is, a, which is a German version of like also for small and medium companies, very widely used. Um, we're just picking the, the, the ones of the, the biggest market penetration and then going to the next one. Um, and we also, we hope that they have that they all have some kind of API that we can actually use and put our data in. Um, we, we won't rely on them building Coino into their, their, their apps, that's for sure, but usually they have some kind of API or some kind of standard format where we can just give a report and then it can be imported easily. Okay, well, I mean, there's lots more to talk about. Uh, you know, we want to cover some issues regarding security and also talk about, like, the the, the, the Bitcoin scene, I guess, in Europe. You've got lots to, to say about that. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about our sponsor, Shapeshift. Of course, you know Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to uh, buy and sell 
altcoins, we'll exchange altcoins for one another. And, uh, well, we've been doing this new thing for uh, since last, last episode. We thought it would be interesting to use Shapeshift to tip uh, someone or some service of our choice. Uh, and, uh, Levin, you said that you wanted to tip uh, Andreas Schiltbeck? Yeah, so we depend can heavily you, on... Can you explain why? Yeah, people need to, to, to be able to, to send us the data, uh, the, the, the public key data. And the, before it was very difficult, and Andreas was actually the first one to implement it in a very easy, convenient way. So you can just tip a button, and then you say, like, export my public key, and then you send it to yourself and put it into Coino. So um, when, we, when we opened our project as the, the beta, he immediately released this new feature too. And now people are very easily able to connect it. And Mycelium is also coming to the market. And, and so this is why I would love to contribute to this uh, completely open source, free time project of Andreas Schildbach. And I really like the, the Android app, um, Bitcoin Wallet. And that's why I think that we should give some, uh, uh, yeah, some, some love to him. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, I just sent them some Dogecoin using uh, using Shapeshift. Uh, so he had a, bit, a Bitcoin address on his website. I used the Dogecoin that I had in my wallet to send him uh, about a dollar and a half. And so that's taking about a couple, it's taking a few seconds to do that. And so the, the nice thing about Shapeshift is that they support about a dozen cryptocurrencies as of now. They're adding new coins all the time. And it, they don't require that you create an account to use it. So you basically go to the website, shapeshift.io. They've got their currency conversion tool there, which looks a lot like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. And uh, you select the, the currency you want to convert and the con currency you want to convert to. And just as you see here on the screen, uh, you send the, the currency that you have to the uh, QR code they display. And then uh, in just a few seconds, they exchange that and send it to the uh, address. So it doesn't have to be your address, as demonstrated here. It can also be, you know, somebody else's tip address. It could be a merchant, for example. You could be spending uh, Dogecoin to buy uh, something with Bitcoin, for example. So, you know, the, the, there's lots of different possibilities for this. And Brian, you also mentioned uh, perhaps using it for hedging in some cases. Yeah, I mean, so I, I cannot really vet these currencies, but uh, there are two that are meant to be pegged to the U.S. dollar. One is new bits, and one is bit USD. So, you know, in principle, right, like we've talked about all yeah. I think we really lost Brian. So, yeah, what, what he was saying there is that basically what you can do is, you know, if you're using, like, a currency like Newbits or, um, or a bit USD, you could use one of those stable currencies to, to hedge, essentially, sending Bitcoins to that using Shapeshift. So, uh, Shapeshift, the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. Uh, go to shapeshift.io, give it a try, tell us what you think, and we'd like to thank them for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So, coming back to uh, Coino, um, so tell us about some of the different, like, there seems to be some issues with this regarding privacy because you do have to hand over all of your public keys. Uh, you know, it is very secure on the, on, from the perspective that you don't hold private keys, but you do have to hand over your public keys, and that means that you guys have access essentially to you know, a company's uh, entire um, transaction history yeah. and their financial information. Uh, why should people trust you with that? So uh, right now, they, they need to trust us like they, they trust the bank. Um, I mean, they, they would just assume that we kind of like protect the data in, in uh, every possible means. Uh, of course, as a Bitcoiner, this is not really like the satisfying answer that one would expect. So uh, in, the, in the long run, we're currently working on, on more ideas like encrypting the data client side. Um, it's difficult right now to do it. And there are others trying it and also not succeeding until now because of the issue with the uh, or the feature that we want to provide uh, the user with the usage of the HD seeds. Um, on the other hand, a, a company usually doesn't care as much about the privacy of their financial data as uh, maybe someone who's a private person. And I mean, to a certain degree, they also might at some point uh, provide transparency. So they could do that very easy with an HD seed and say, here, look at the, all the transactions that went through the seed. 
and see our, our balance sheet or something. So uh, it depends always on the case. doesn't mean that we should uh, lose the data. We need to protect it as good as we can and take care that, for example, if somebody uh, requires a, a deletion of his account, that we really delete all the data and don't keep copies on, on track. That's something that we, um, we want to provide in a very uh, profound way on our end. Um, but on the other side, a lot of people use services such as Coinbase. And there I have to say, there you also, like, first of all, you need all to do all the KYC and AML stuff. Uh, you provide them with all your details, and then you also connect all your Bitcoin transactions to it. And uh, we, we can't be as good as you using your own wallet and only doing face-to-face -face transactions to get your Bitcoins. Of course, there is a risk that at some point some data is leaked, but it's still much better than some central service such as, for example, Coinbase or another exchange if we, if you use it as a wallet, because then they see all your transactions, have access to your keys, and also you need to connect your complete identity. With us, you can give us a fake email if you want. Uh, we don't care about it all about that. Um, so tell us a bit about what has your experience been like uh, starting a, a, Bitcoin, a Bitcoin startup in Berlin? So uh, coincidentally, as we started, it went pretty well because um, we found this accelerator program, Axel Springer Plug and Play. It's a joint venture from Axel Springer, which is a very big uh, media publisher, and Plug and Play, the US-based uh, incubator or accelerator program. Um, they were actively looking for Bitcoin companies when we thought about joining in, and um, then we applied, and they took us in. So we got a little cash. Uh, for some shares, and uh, we were um, we were supervised by them. We got like like hands-on workshops, and also we got a lot of exposure to people, uh, influential people as well as investors and so on. So um, this has been very good, a very good experience, accelerator-wise. But after that, it kind of like like start start dragging a little because um, to our experience here in Germany, the investor scene is not as Bitcoin eager as it is maybe in the US or in the UK, so there's what we, where we see a little gap uh, between this accelerator and now the additional uh, investment. And also there are very few Bitcoin-related investments in startups in Germany overall. Uh, you can like, count them on, on one hand, I think, uh, especially the ones that go be beyond 50 to 100K, which where just, I mean, like the, the, the real business just begins to start. So the Bitcoin scene in Germany, uh, as far as I can tell, is rather uh, timid, and people like investors are also very hesitant to uh, put money onto, onto the table. So, have you uh, have you also tried to um, get in touch with investors from the U.S. or from other places that may be more open? Yeah, we're just currently expanding. The unfortunate situation is, of course, for a German company that we are too small yet uh, to to attract the interest of a very large VC. And the question is so. So the question is uh, um, whether or not we can make them actually uh, hand the money over the ocean. So usually, a very large investor wants to uh, only invest if he either like he invests in a small company if he has a tight grip on the company and can uh, see that the that the founders are actually using the funds in the best way that they can uh, that they should do it. Or if the company becomes larger and a lot of other investors are already in there, he can just leverage these other investors to make sure that the company is like. Uh, keeping the right records and everything. So um, we, we we were thinking about moving maybe to the U.S. to to get an additional funding there at the current situation. But actually, we still hope for finding some angels here in Germany and then move on maybe and get the attraction of a U.S. investor for a bigger round after that. So you would actually try to move the company uh, as a as a legal entity or actually also operationally to the U.S. Yeah, it's more about the operational part than about the legal. Uh, we might also move the legal end, but uh, the operational part sometimes is more important. So the investor wants you to stay half a year or so in the U.S. We will see about that. This is just an option. Actually, we really like Berlin. Berlin is a very good place for a startup because it's really cheap to live. And also for a Bitcoin startup, uh, like data protection-wise and so on, is much better than in the U.S. So um, I would rather have my customer data here than in the U.S., where the NSA could just knock down the door and I wouldn't be able to tell anyone about it. Now, before we before we restarted the show, we were talking about, uh, you know, of course, we all live in Europe, and we, we've seen the, invest, the investor numbers in the latest uh, uh, Coindesk uh, City Bitcoin report regarding the amount of investment money, VC money, that has gone into European startups versus 
American startups, and you know the the gap there is actually quite staggering. Uh, I believe it's something about 95 percent. No, well, no, I, I think it was, it's not that high, at least according to the CoinDesk report. But uh, it's a, it's a bit tricky, right? Because I think some companies like uh, Blockchain or Info or other companies are counted as European, yes, where it's of not so clear. But there is there is quite a large gap, in, you know, between the in, the uh, investment money that come that is going into U.S. companies and the investment money that is going to uh, European companies. And I, I guess that's probably you know, that could also be said for other sectors as well. It could be said for the tech sector as well. Um, what uh, what are your thoughts on that? Why do you think that is, and what do you think needs to happen in order for that to change? I mean, to a certain degree, this is, of course, uh, connected to the usual uh, um, difference between the U.S. And, and, and Europe. In Europe, our investors are not as, as tech driven, not as adventurous, usually, as they are in, uh, in the U.S. On the other hand, I mean, like, Europe has a track record, especially during of building up very large, very resistant, very successful companies, such as all the car companies in Germany. But these are more businesses that the, that, that the investor can understand. They usually do bootstrapping and they kind of like importing the very idea of uh, building startups and then and pushing them and then just like fast tracking them to something. Uh, Sex Wunderkinder, Six Wunderkinder is an example for that that had actually like a real like real funding round yet. But but besides from these some examples, usually this in Germany or in Europe, especially on the on the, the France and Germany, I'd say the, the business is done in another way than in the U.S. Um, with Bitcoin, this of course adds up to the next layer because you usually can't provide enough traction today, enough revenue today to to I mean like to 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 make to satisfy uh, any kind of request from the from the investor for this his investment. I mean like uh, have a look at ChangeTip. They got like when they got the investment, I don't know, three and a half million, I think. They had like seventy thousand US dollar total revenue ever over their service. So. I mean, this is not something that you usually would base such an investment on, but it's projection. And this is what U.S. investors have. They have vision. They think Bitcoin is the next big thing. And here in Germany, people just ask me, yeah, I read about this Bitcoin. I thought it's bankrupt now. What's the point about that? And this is the usual conversation I have with an investor, unfortunately. I mean, to a certain degree, politicians make the, the economy here, too, in, in Europe and, and also in Germany. So they kind of decide what is good technology, what not, and then they, they, like, they, they pay all the stuff for that. For example, like all the green energy that we have over here. Uh, it's not only for tax reductions, but also like really serious money getting into it, being pushed into it, which leads to a lot of, like, like a lot of, of, of crops and so on in Germany just built to be burned or, or, or turned into, into, into gas or so, uh, which becomes a problem somewhere. So, I mean, like we have, we have this kind of like, more maybe the, the government has a stronger hand here in planning the economy than it has in the US and this of course leads to only secure ideas or, or, or conventional ideas because I don't think that a politician will uh, risk his next election on the basis that he kind of like pushed a Bitcoin startup uh, to, to, to build up something that then in the end didn't really work out the way that he intended it to do. Um, yeah, so I think that, that the lack of private investors and, and that, that it's not so common that you solely rely on, on a private investor. I mean, a lot of people tell us, yeah, there's this state program and the other one, you can get a very cheap loan here and this is where you build up your company. You should do some contracting first and so on. There's a general uh, different uh, approach to this kind of uh, investment and uh, building up a company. Yeah, and then this also from the government. You're right about that. Brian, I'm curious. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I... I think I agree with Levin, and it's pretty obvious. You know, there is that discrepancy. I mean, I think if you look at tech investment in general, like the U.S. is something like uh, ten times as high, I think, as like the startup space than Europe. Now, if you look at that coin as before, there is some outliers. You know, like some mining companies, but for the most part, uh, you know, it, it is very nascent, right? Like there, there's just not that much going on. And I think another thing uh, besides the, uh, the investor side is that this kind of attitude also carries over to actual you know, entrepreneurs and people in the startup space. So it, I think it's, it's not just them, but it's also people, uh, people try to start safe things, right? They try to start things that are sort of like true and tested. Uh, and, and Bitcoin isn't like really one of them and, and I think in, in Germany there may also be a certain like 
uh, like almost emotional resistance towards something like Bitcoin. That's like, oh, this is like speculative or like somehow uh, not a good thing, right? I, I mean, I, I do think there's a people are you know aren't as open to it. So, and and you know this is one thing that I've definitely noticed. You know, running the meetup here, and and I would love to change a bit is that just have more startup people like be interested in Bitcoin, like look at, at starting Bitcoin companies. And I, I think it's changing a little bit. Like, I mean, I, I have gotten like quite a few requests, for example, to give talks at, at, at regular tech events, not Bitcoin focused events about Bitcoin, uh, like in the next month. So I, I think it's maybe slowly changing. But, you know, that being said, it's, 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 definitely, it's definitely a big problem. And of course, you know, Berlin especially is is well known for for companies like uh, like Rocket Internet or um, so if people haven't heard of it, you know they, they kind of became famous by just copying a successful American startup models that you see like oh it works right like obviously this is a model that works you just do the same thing in Germany and build it up as fast as possible and then try to sell it you know so not a very original approach like an approach like 100% focused on execution not on ideas not on being innovative necessarily and and that's very very popular here there are a lot of people doing that there's like rocket internet who've spun up hundreds of companies by now there are people again copying that and and so i think it's yeah it's it's not the best environment for bitcoin bitcoin startups that's for sure uh, and i guess a lot of it will also sort of depend on how the regulatory situation is going uh, in the future, and then that that one is very hard to predict. So I, you know, it's hard to predict how this bit license thing turns out. So that could change things again, and maybe that would make Europe a more attractive place than the U.S. But hard to tell. And also, if, I mean, I have to say that from the experience that I have from the accelerator, I mean, we're people, we people uh, who, are, who are who are not really really involved with such small companies, and they're like decision maker lobbyists and so on, like bankers, where they're frequently even some. Uh, tech ministers from some some countries in, in, in India or whatever, and and so we talked to these people, and a lot of them they can't like a lot of them heard Bitcoin for the first time and said like okay, it's very interesting, but also some others they really listened into it and they're really thrilled about it. So so we had all kinds of reactions like people saying, okay, now I finally understand Bitcoin. We need to do something against it, and we had people like yeah, this is really the, the next big thing. Like like even people coming from banks and so on who are really thrilled about it and you want to do something with it because they understand that this has potential. So, I mean, this is, of course, what the, what the Bitcoin ecosystem needs to do, education, 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 and of course, also helpful to have all these uh, examples from the US. Like, they, there has been huge investment into it. I mean, we always tell people this because then they see, okay, this must be something about the whole Bitcoin thing. It's not just these two weirdos here talking about it, but there's actually real serious money flowing into it. So, of course, we can leverage the US part, and in Europe, also, people are awakening and are seeing the potentials of the technology. And uh, one thing to take into account here as well is that you know a startup is always a speculative thing, right? Like you're always taking big risks, and there's always a high rate of failure. But now, of course, with Bitcoin, it it's it feels uh, definitely to someone who isn't convinced Bitcoin's going to be the thing, and you know maybe this is slightly different for us. But it definitely feels like like you're stacking the risk here. Like first of all, there's the Bitcoin risk. Like so that may work or that may fail. And if it fails, it's pretty clear your startup is going to fail. Uh, and then if it works, then there's still your startup risk, right? So yeah, you, you kind of have uh, you have more risk. I think that there's no question that uh, if you do something like Bitcoin, then if you do like pizza delivery startup or something. Yeah, um, but the potential outcome is also like 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 much much higher. Right. Possible. And I mean, like this question is also like maybe like asked for every Bitcoin startup. And the other thing is that I think a lot of people, especially uh, large hedge funds and so on, they need to start risk hedging the risk. I mean, if Bitcoin becomes like like the thing that we all envision it becoming, then maybe some other stocks that they have with large banks and so on, they will go to dust. So just for this risk, if they like measure like one percent chance that Bitcoin takes off, they should put one percent of their money into Bitcoin. Related stuff, which is usually a Bitcoin startup or Bitcoin company. So um, or Bitcoin itself. Yeah, Bitcoin itself. I don't know. Actually, I don't think that this is a very valuable investment for a for a for a um, for 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 a uh, organization that is investing money because 
Uh, right now, this is a huge risk that one is taking that Bitcoin has a flaw that it will be found at some point and then be replaced by an altcoin. So um, if you invest uh, in some, some company that's building up on the technology, you're just betting on the technology and Bitcoin itself. So, I mean, these people I think maybe that Bitcoin at some points might be out, outlawed or banned or so, and then some kind of like the euro coin issued by the central bank will take its place but use the same technology but have some kind of control mechanisms or so. This is the way I think that some institutional investors think. And and for that, they still can use the, the same company that has been doing stuff with Bitcoin for this new coin as long as it's also using blockchain technology. So guys, I'm curious, uh, we talked about this before, uh, you know, the, the sort of seeming gap between the tech startup scene in Berlin and the Bitcoin startup scene in Berlin, which, I mean, arguably in Europe is probably one of the, one of the most, I mean, one of the cities where there are the most startups, uh, say from London perhaps, in terms of you know, Bitcoin startups. Have you noticed that uh, those two scenes are starting to come together and synergies happening there? Yes, yeah, so, uh, personally I feel for the most part that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, to think about that, Levin. Uh, we're currently um, exploring to, 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 you, the, to London. We, we're going there as soon in two weeks or so. Um, there was another Bitcoin startup, um, Satoshi Pay, in the very same accelerator as us, and even in the same batch. Um, so we could share experiences with them. And Meinhardt from this company, he went to the UK. Uh, he was very well received there. Um, he talked about his product. Everybody is very thrilled about Bitcoin. So I think that London is far ahead. And you also had some visitors here, as you can remember, maybe from the Econometrics guys. Uh, they stayed a couple of, of weeks or, or days at least uh, in the Bitcoin Center here in Berlin. And um, there, on some occasions, people came over here, but it has a little uh, slowed down. And I think all this is also due to the price, of course. Right now, I think the whole Bitcoin scene is a little hibernating. Uh, might also be easier to raise funds when, when the Bitcoin is going through the roof to the moon and not has just crashed another 30% over the last two weeks. So um, I think that, that people will, will, like, right now, I, I see everywhere people, like, like laying low a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, but uh, uh, last last year, uh, the, the the scenes were connected to a certain degree, and I think this will go on further. We should do more about France, actually. Than, than <laughs> uh, I think I think you know the fact that people are laying low is definitely also uh, true here. the The Bitcoin Association here is not really doing much. I mean, we haven't had any board meetings or anything like that. In uh, uh, I mean, since like since I came on um, the association. So, I mean, it, there's not much happening in terms of uh, activity at the association level. I think the price probably has a lot to do with that. Uh, you know. not, not enough Bitcoins to buy a, a dinner at the board meeting, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, now, you know, some of the echoes that I've been hearing from Paris, of course, I'm not in Paris, so I, I, I'm not, like, right in the middle of it, but... Uh, you know, I, I heard things that La Maison du Bitcoin was not attracting as many startups as they wanted to, so they're now like kind of sort of rethinking their strategy and the uh, like their their like their idea to have some sort of accelerator thing. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. So I think they've sort of rearranged that space to now work on their own projects. One of which is the Ledger Wallet. Uh, it's a smart card wallet that was. Uh, released not too long ago, and that they're now selling. So I guess like that's one. One project that has come out of there and that uh, you know has some potential. Uh, other projects that came out of there have sort of uh, disappeared. Um, then there's Paymium, of course, that has uh, announced that Ingenico, the credit card terminal company, is going to be integrating Bitcoin payments in all of their terminals starting next year. So that's like really interesting, really good news, I guess. Um, but right. it, 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 it's focused around one or two companies, and uh, you know, other than that, I, there's not a whole lot of activity that that I'm aware of. And also, one shouldn't forget that just because Bitcoin, you you don't build as easy a, a successful company. This is still uh, it's still a hard job to do. You'll work a lot. Uh, you, you have your ups, you have your downs, and in the end, it's yeah, what you say is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think people. A lot of people in the Bitcoin sphere, they, they made some money on their Bitcoin investment, and they think that being an entrepreneur and building a company is uh, as easy as that, and it's actually not. So um, I think that this is also something that, that we should keep in mind. Um, for example, this accelerator I'm talking about, I have a little insight about the 
applications that they got right now. And um, I mean, they they, they, they they had two Bitcoin startups in their last batch. They got some exposure for that. So it should be, I think people should apply internationally. You, everybody can apply uh, for this accelerator. And they got like two or three Bitcoin applications, which we are really like dubious to a certain degree, or at least one of them that I thought. So, so um, my point is that, that uh, uh, there's also a lack of good business ideas in the Bitcoin scene, so it's not so easy. So uh, I'd like to come back just before we wrap up to uh, to Coino. Um, tell us about your team. Yeah, so um, we're currently uh, three people. So um, here in Berlin, it's Erasmus, my, my co-founder, and, and me. And we have a, uh, a very, very good um, engineer in, in Brazil who did a lot of the... Um, stuff the plumbing in the background, build up the, the scaling uh, Node.js application uh, with us. And um, uh, that's Leopoldo. And yeah, so, so this, is, this is what who we are. We are three people and um, want to expand the team as soon as possible. Would you mind uh, walking us through a demo? No, no, it will be my pleasure. So okay, well, um, how do I do let's, that? Let's do see it. It well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll set up the screen share here and you can just walk me through it. Okay. Yeah, so um, so this is actually already with some data in there. So um, this is a cast test account of mine, as you can see in the upper right corner. Uh, it's uh, living at coin.com. And you can go to the, on the left side, you have a navigation bar, and you could click on the wallet symbol maybe first. And this is actually where you end up when you start using the service. Um, usually you start with zero wallets, so you would need to add one. So you can click on the button to add a wallet. And there you see that there um, the wallets that we support. We're currently still working on the little, uh, um, yeah, like front end stuff. You know, like it's not really beautiful, but uh, we're polishing this right now. And uh, I can only see it in a small window right now. Oh, okay, I can click here. Um, so um, yeah, Bitcoin wallet. This is the other wallet that we support currently. Uh, we're planning on supporting also the other ones that are currently blocked um, as soon as possible. Some of them we are in negotiations to a certain degree also to make. Um, them share the public seed data uh, that, for example, um, the, the um, bread wallet on iPhone, I would really love uh, the av availability of the feature too as, as soon as possible. Because a lot but of wallets don't, don't actually share that data with their users. Uh, yes, you can't export it as easily from the wallet. It's not something that, that people um, envisioned to be shared in the first place, but mm. uh, we find that it's a very good idea to do so, but some right. people think that... Uh, that this is data you shouldn't share, and then they want to prevent you from it. It's kind of like own your device, own your app, and people should ask for these kind of features if they want to. So when, when I when I first came in here and added my wallet, I said, oh, HD seed, like what he wants my seed. I thought he said he didn't have he didn't use the the, the private keys. Then I realized that that's actually uh, the uh, the XPub or the public key seed, which allows you to just have uh, to see the public keys. So. Yeah, so this is exactly it. So we have guides for all the wallets, how you get out the data. Um, it's usually rather easy. Um, we will walk you through it. Uh, and especially, like, just keep attention that you always only share your public key with us. I mean, if you would put in your private key, I'm not really sure about the formula, but usually we shouldn't even accept it. So you wouldn't just um, show it. And right. now there are some added, like, some already added wallets. Um, there are three of them here. Um, these are just demo accounts. There's an Electrum wallet, which uh, could be an Electrum cold storage uh, wallet, where you keep some funds secure. Then um, there's on the right side, there's a Bitcoin wallet. Um, this is my mobile phone, what I use on the mobile phone. And then I have another wallet, a Mycelium uh, app, also on the same phone, but it's for business, uh, for business uh, affairs. And uh, currently, if you click on the, um, yeah, if you now go to the transfers panel, um, this, oh, this is, is where it gets interesting. This is where uh, oh, let me see here. Let's open so, this up a bit more so people can see. Yeah. There we so, go. so, also we're working on the responsiveness of that. But the but this is where, where what Coino does for the users. So you we start making sense out of the transactions. So beforehand you would you, you couldn't separate a transaction that went from your phone out of there, whether it went to another of your wallets or to an external party, whether you paid for a pizza with it or whether you just transferred money to your cold storage account. I mean, you could just match the, the Bitcoin address from one wallet to the other, but this, of course, uh, um, makes it very painful for you to do by hand. So we can connect this. We can see that the money actually went from your phone to the cold storage. And okay, so, so just, just so we understand here, so this green part here, this is money coming into the wallet, and then... Uh, this is an extra. This is a transaction coming out of the wallet. Yeah. Okay. So, but 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 when you say out of the wallet, this is a this is something coming into your 
possession. Pool of wallet. This is coming into your possession, right? So it's not really the wallet. It's what you own. It's your 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 wor net worth. So your net worth is increasing by 0.1 bitcoins here, and it's decreasing by uh, 0.01 bitcoins over here. And so yeah. these are the transfers within the system. Exactly. And uh, for example, if you wanted to do a tax report not right now, these weren't taxable events. The others were. Like you get bitcoins in, you kind of buy them for whatever you did. And then when you send the bitcoins, you sell them for the service that you're receiving. So both of them are taxable events, but these ones in the middle, the internal transfers, are not. And so what's interesting also is to, just to look at these values on the side. So you get the dollar value at the, at the moment where uh, what, the transfer when, happened. when the transfer happened. Yeah. So this is, a very, this is the crucial information. I mean, a lot of wallets show, or for example, blockchain.info shows you the valuation today. But what uses is if you see a transfer over a year ago. So um, this is what we think is more valuable to the users, show the, um, the, the, the value of the Bitcoins at the time uh, uh, that, that were transferred. Um, we pull this data from uh, CoinDesk currently from their API. Uh, um, we want uh, to, to provide some kind of like average pricing method there. But in the end, people should also be able to just change the, the amount if they know that they pay for something that costs $8 or had, like they transferred eight dollars worth of Bitcoin, but we actually think it's like seven dollars ninety-five, then they should be able to adjust this amount too for the tax report. So some of the features that you mentioned you'll be adding to this is the ability to label transactions? Yeah, to label transactions, to label recipients and senders. So you say like, yeah, okay, this is external right now, but actually I know it's coming from uh, my my mother. These were like like payments from my mother or from my uh, employer or something. And then on the other side, you'd say like this is the this is the the burger joint where I just had the, this great night. So and then you can also track like we want to do a little bit like mint.com for Bitcoin um, too, so that you can you can see like what budget was I on, what where did I spend my bitcoins. Um, this is what we want to provide for our users. Awesome. Uh, what other what other type of features uh, can we expect in uh, the the actual release when 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 the beta period's over? So, so the beta is more for, for getting it stable and, and adding more features to it. We want to support as many wallets as we can and also online services such as Coinbase, Blockchain.info, um, all the major exchanges. Um, so, so people can also track the Bitcoins when they are on there. We're currently looking also into Ripple. So some people use Ripple to transfer money from one exchange to the other. Um, this is more difficult than just adding the exchanges. Also, some exchanges have the problem that when, you, when we call the API and ask for the user's transactions, they tell us that bitcoins have been withdrawn, but they don't tell us where they went to. So we need to kind of like find out ourselves where the recipient address was. Was it one of the wallets? We need to like like connect these these transfers, and this is the what we're working on to ease and automate the process as much as possible. And once we're done with that, we should be out of beta, um, and then we should be able to provide tax reports, which is the main first feature that we think that people will use. Uh, get all your data from all the exchanges, from your wallets, in, and then. Uh, just uh, yeah, get the report out. And when's the beta period over? Uh, yeah, for the uh, like one or two months, I think. Um, this is something that, but people should not expect the beta to change completely with with the final release. Um, once the beta is kind of done, then we just switch it to to a final release. So everybody's happy to use it already today. And uh, if you find any issues, if you have any recommendations, just keep in touch and uh, uh, send us a, a message on Twitter or wherever. Cool. cool. Well, I, I can't wait uh, to use this for our own bookkeeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, tax, uh, tax is uh, coming up at some yeah. point. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that's definitely a product that uh, we'll have to look at at that time. So no, well, one, one, thing, one thing I think that that would be valuable in here as well is you know the influencing part, because that that's some that's something that I, I think few. Uh, payment processors and merchant uh, processors do right now is like actual invoicing, like proper invoicing where you can add items line per line and with price and stuff. I mean, uh, Coinbase is just horrible. Like, I think BitPay does something. Like, there's Coin Simple also that seems to be okay, but they're, they're missing some components there. So, I think that that's one thing that you, you guys could also probably get right. Yes, we will definitely work on that. Cool. Well, Levin, uh, thanks so much for joining us today uh, to talk about uh, Coino. We'll have links to Coino uh, in the show notes so uh, people can, can check out the service, can download it, uh, give you guys feedback. 
Um, you know, I, I hope you guys are going to be successful, like raising. Uh, well, I guess also, like you guys, there there are fundraising at the moment. So if if any investors are listening to that, I think it's definitely an interesting uh, an interesting startup. And uh, I think I guess it's one that has has a lot of potential, at least in my view. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, You're welcome. We appreciate you coming on, and uh, thanks to our listener for listening to the show this week. Uh, if you have um, any questions, comments, uh, just get in touch. You can tweet at us with Epicenter BTC. Uh, you can also uh, follow us on uh, or subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can you can get the latest videos. Uh, or, you know, give us a tip. Uh, you can do that too. <laughs> at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips. And you can use Shapeshift to tip us with your whatever coin. Uh, <laughs> So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.